The Pacers did it. One of their biggest games of the season. A lot at stake. It goes to clutch time, and they get it done. Pacers beat the Heat by two. The veterans were were great. Dave Sturrell, a.k.a. Miller Time Pod, and I are going to break it all down today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, y'all? Happy Monday, and welcome into another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and SI, and today, hooey, they did it. The Pacers get it done. They beat the Heat 117-115 to get a game ahead of the Heat in the standings. They get the tiebreaker over the Heat. They're ahead of the 76ers. They have the three-way tiebreaker. The Pacers now amazingly control their own destiny for fifth in the East, not sixth, fifth after the impressive win. So much to talk about. The veterans were great. The Pacers were very poised. They won a clutch game. It was their biggest game of the season. They not only, again, control their own destiny for the postseason, they have wiggle room. They can lose a game this week. We talk about a lot of those scenarios, too. Dave Sorrell, a.k.a. Miller Time Pod, going to join us to break it all down and plenty more. We get off the rails quite a bit. Purdue, uh, the Eclipse, so much is covered today. Today's episode uh, is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com. Slash locked on NBA and use the code all lowercase locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Let's talk Pacers Heat. Let's get right to it. When the Pacers beat the Heat, you bring on someone who was talking and covering the Pacers when they had the series against the Heat, the pod father himself, Dave Searle. Miller Time Pod is here. What a game, Dave. Pacers get the win over the Heat. Uh, for the people who like updates, I'll keep it as simple as possible, even though it's probably a little more complicated than this. If the Pacers go two and one this week, at minimum, they're in the playoffs. No plan required. If they go 3-0 and this week, their floor is actually now the five seed because the Cavs are flailing all over the place. Uh, the Spurs and 76ers are playing as we speak. If the Sixers lose, the Pacers only need one win to clinch top seven, and one heat loss would also, in that case, clinch them top six. That is what was at stake in this game, Dave, and the Pacers got it done. It was a very impressive win for a young team you know I, I have one takeaway from that rundown that you just gave me i didn't absorb any of that information you're <laughs> gonna have to tweet all of that out again but the one thing that i took away from that is that you are at odds with uh, kevin pritchard you do not consider the play-in to be the actual playoffs i do not i hope <laughs> no one does, it does not count. pritchard pritchard does at least when they were in it he considers it the playoffs when it's he was defending favorite. when he was defending his job and saying how he was doing he, that hey, was the it was the playoffs season. then <laughs> I do remember that. Yes, they did play in the postseason, as they called it in 2021. Um, yeah, this was huge. I mean, they have they now have the tiebreaker over the Heat and a game up on them. So they're really two games up on the Heat. Uh, and they have the three-way tiebreaker with Philly and Miami, which is why they can still lose once and get sixth for sure. So there's a lot of funky nomics at stake. Um yeah. because you know, I I saw a little bit of a, a lot of out in the world Pacer fans, and I understand every loss does this and every win does that. <laughs> but a while back, you were looking at how tough the schedule was, and I just saw so many people say, like, well, they're definitely in the playing game now. <laughs> and now we just, the only thing left to figure out is like, which game is like, you know, it's like, yeah, the schedule is tough, but one thing that could happen is they win games. Like, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, well, the, the schedule's tougher. It's harder to win, but you can, they can still win the games. Like, it's possible. And so it's kind of cool to see how well they're doing. I mean, they're the, uh, over the last 10 games, second best in the Eastern Conference, only Boston Celtics have had a better record. They're seven and three when it counts. That's great. The, uh, I like losing the Brooklyn at home, but I mean Brooklyn on the road. But you know that's well, uh, they're still they, they've done very well down the stretch. I think that Brooklyn games actually makes me laugh because in five days the fan base in my mentions at least went from <laughs> this is a play in team at best when they lose to the Nets <laughs> to I have people tweeting at me now saying well they can't get to five they have to avoid Boston in the second round I'm like the second <laughs> round wait 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 <laughs> four days ago people weren't even talking about <laughs> making it. But that is the, but that, but yeah. I will say that is the reality of winning this game against the Heat is that is now a like thing that flashes across the mind of the Pacers scenarios. 
especially if the Sixers lose this game because with Embiid, they've been rolling and he's out tonight. Um, we should talk about the game the Pacers actually won, perhaps their biggest non-in-season tournament game of the season. I was telling people this, you know, like leading up to the game, like for some of the guys on this team, had they not made the in-season tournament finals, and they did, so this is stupid, but this would have been like the biggest game of their careers if had that not happened, right? Like it sure. was huge. It was a huge game with stakes, with a lot at, uh, on the line to potentially get yourself into the playoffs. And they came and out awesome. They did great. They were amazing. The Pacers were, they did not play great in the clutch or in the second half, but they were right. so good for the first 20, I'd say, minutes of this game that it didn't matter. They were able to win. And starting a game with that kind of poise and that kind of, you know, just effectiveness right. and not getting detracted by a good Heat team. And yes, the Heat were not making anything, but the Pacers did well to have good offense against a team that hadn't given up 120 in like a month. That was impressive to me. I think that that is a big takeaway for this team. They were ready when they needed to be. And, you know, it's like with a young team, there's always going to be ups and downs. Like they had a lead on Brooklyn and they just, I think they probably let it slip a little bit. I mean, they just let a foot off the gas. You can't let the foot off the gas and there's going to be ups and downs, but just to see them, like you said, not just play well in this game, but from the start. Like yeah. they just look so crisp and, you know, every shot that was open was going in. And, you know, if you look at, um, you know, obviously they let off the gas a little bit in a way. I think that they were almost like a managing lead sort of situation. They continue to struggle. Uh, offense. Be inconsistent when they have to get ground down into half court off offense, especially in clutch situations. They're still trying to figure that out. But I love my, my favorite stat of this whole game is six turnovers. One miss from the free throw line. You know, that's unbelievable. I yeah. mean, they they barely turned the ball over and they hit almost every single free throw they got. And, you know, uh, combine that with how well they played at the beginning of this game against a team that has an insane amount of experience in the postseason, playing tough games, beating above ga uh, winning games that they shouldn't be winning. I mean, that's one of the most seasoned teams in the Eastern Conference. And they came in and they needed it just as badly as the Pacers did. And they came in yes. and they they kicked their asses in the first half. And that's <laughs> a really, really encouraging sign to see for sure. That was really cool. So the turnover thing, I was going to get to this, but you're going to make me get to it now because so here's something I was tracking in the game. The Heat started one for 15 from three. But the reason in my head I thought this is not going to be over is because the you know when the Heat's first turnover was, Dave? I don't know. With six minutes and five seconds to go in the second quarter. So wow. the Heat played 18 minutes without a turnover, and the Pacers finished this game with fewer turnovers than the Heat, right? right. Like that is yeah. that is what their offensive execution ended up being because they did a great job not letting Miami, who's a good defense, bog them down in that way, and that is hard to do. And, of course, it's five of the six turnovers were the point guards who were handling it the whole time, so like not surprising at all. But I think that is very impressive from the Pacers, who, again, were jumped out to the start they were on because they were shooting really well. Okay, so I texted you a few notes in the first half, and then the second half I didn't because <laughs> the game got a little wild. Uh, but I think if we're going to start with any one thing, do you agree it has to be TJ McConnell, or would you like to go with a different veteran player that I also think played a very good game? I thought you were going to say Miles Turner. I, was yeah, he was the, I was waffling between I, I got the, I wore the uh, Miles Turner t-shirt jersey. We'll do Miles first. In his honor. Yeah, do Miles. I mean, one thing that I thought was really cool is that obviously – the importance of this game is paramount and they went into this game with the strategy of that Turner was just going to fall Bam around every single time Bam came out, Turner came out, checked in, they played like they matched exactly. And it was, you know, you, we've seen games that were important that miles Turner had, a he could protect the rim and have a defensive impact. But as far as one-on-one -on -one guarding the best big man on the other team. We've seen times where that's been a little bit of a weakness of the Pacers, honestly. And so to go in with that plan of like, Turner, you're, you're shattering Bam. You know, like you're one of the elite bigs in the Eastern Conference. We don't care if this guy was a starter in the um, All-Star game. You're going to go out and watch him every single time and win. And he did a great job. I mean, not just, you know, getting his points and maybe just kind of limiting uh, Bam as best he could, but out-rebounding him. You know, like that doesn't really happen yeah. all that much. And like he doesn't seem to – always win those uh, rebounding battles when he's called upon. So I thought that was huge for his confidence. Um, you know, he did kind of struggle a little bit, I think, at the very end of the game. Uh, uh, but, you know, overall in that game, I think he had a, a very big impact. And if he hadn't gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bam, there's no way that they end up winning this game. So, um, you know, I was, I was really uh, impressed to see that. And obviously, I think probably first half was, was his best half. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so 
37 minutes and one second for Bam. 37 minutes and 19 seconds for Miles Turner, right? You're spot on with the minutes thing. And I, I don't want to say that, like, M- M- Turner has struggled against the Heat in his career. Like, that would be a stretch. He's had good games against Bambi. But Bam has always gotten up for this matchup. And Miles was so good in the first half. He had a double-double at halftime, right? He had 11 points and 10 boards, I believe, at the break. Right. Yep. And to play that kind of minutes load is impressive. To be clear, this is Miles' season high in playing time was this game. And there were a lot of, like, very – look, the Pacers knew how important this game was. There were a lot of very obvious factors, including the fact that they went nine deep, <laughs> that they realized it with the minutes distribution they gave their players. But Miles in particular playing that long with that tough of an assignment. Bam is amazing. Bam is a wonderful player. To handle it that well on both ends was really special. And he hit two threes, but I think both of them were, like – stop a big heat run, got to the foul line a bunch, right? He, in a game where, you know, Halbert only takes 10 shots and Siakam was good, but not like amazing. They needed one of their three, top three to step up. And it was Turner. He was brilliant in the first half of this game. His defense was really solid, really all night, like a big sequence in the game. I think that he got it to seven and he uh, blocked a bam layup on one and it hit a three on the other. And then all of a sudden they were up double digits. And I think Siakam had a three of the possession right after that. Like timely plays, Big moments. We'll talk about another veteran in a second, but he's a guy who's been there before. He's played against the Heat in the playoffs. It was just a brilliant performance for Miles Turner. Yeah, and, uh, and of course, the new, I'll say TJ. I mean, it's the, yeah. the, the the heater that he's been on in general, and just like his ability to if the, if the bench doesn't win their minutes, that's another thing that no matter how well the starters played, it wouldn't have uh, pulled out a victory here if the bench hadn't been as good as they had. And obviously, he was uh, by far the driving factor of that. Okay, sorry. Wembenyama just had an insane block pin. <laughs> that made me my eyes bulge. Did you know that the Spurs, when they win challenges in their arena, the Coyote holds up a giant Uno reverse card? That's amazing. That is, <laughs> that is a cool thing I've never seen before. Okay, yeah, McConnell is where I, I suggested we start, but Turner was a very well. He, Turner started the game better than McConnell right. because he started the game. Uh, late first quarter, early second, TJ McConnell wa- was the Pacers offense. Like he had... So the the second half, the bench got rolling a little more, but like Jalen Smith had four points. Ben Shepard had zero, you know, like the, the Obi Toppin really got rolling in the second half. Obi played a good game, but McConnell was the Pacers bench offense in the first half. And a key part of this game, I was talking with Wes Goldberg yesterday, previewing this game. We talked about McConnell, right? As the role player who could step up and like change this game in favor of the Pacers. And something that, that actually happened in the game that we talked about was this happened a lot for the Pacers. McConnell comes in, the opposing defense says zone, right? Zone time. If Obi Toppin beats us with threes, if Jalen Smith beats us with threes, whatever. And McConnell said, okay, you're going to go zone. I'm just going to do the thing I always do. Find like three feet of space in the paint and just take an eight footer and drill it all night over and over. And like there were old Pacer seasons where that shot, you kind of just like, eh, it's okay. He can make it since the all-star break. It's like, if he can get to it, he should take it every time because he makes 60 plus percent of them tonight. He was 11 for 14. On his way at 22 points without taking a free throw. Unbelievably good game. He and Turner, the two of the vets, but some vets were spectacular. And, and McConnell in the first half was just, I mean, he stabilized them. That, that was the reason they're up so much at halftime. Hey guys, quick little break here so we can talk about the lovely folks over at Prize Picks America's number one fantasy sports app. It's more than 3 million members where you just pick more than or less than on two or more players and watch the winnings roll in. March is over, but the biggest moments in college basketball are still rocking in the month of April. Be a part of the action on prize picks, both for the men's game tonight and more. Get in on the playoff action. Up to 100 times your money on prize picks as soon as the world's best players take the game to a new level. You can now own up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks, turning $10 into $1,000 with basketball, hockey, and college basketball entries today on prize picks. America's number one fantasy sports app. How it works is simple. Pick players, pick stats. Are they going to go more than or less than? Steph Curry, more or less than 29 points. Nikola Jokic, more than or less than 10 rebounds. Kalen Clark. Played last night more than less than 30 points. It's that simple. Download the app today. Use the code LockdownNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, price picks. Download the app today. Use the code LockdownNBA. First deposit match up to $100 at price picks. Pick more. Pick less. It's that easy. Yeah, and uh, you know, just being able to have that, just that counter punch. You know, if if you're kind of looking for answers, get the very tough defense. Having somebody that just always finds the tiny little crack and be able to, uh, to get it done. I mean, what else is there to say about the guy? I mean, it, it, 
Yeah. He, I've been watching him for years, and it still astonishes me every time that he has a game like this. It really kind of does. I think, uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, I, I shame on me for continuing to be uh, surprised, I guess. But, um, you know, what a delightful player to be able to kind of cheer for and, like, that's going to be fun in the playoffs. You know, they're, they're going to, uh, if nothing else, you're going to have to focus on him. You have to respect what he's going to be able to do. You know, hopefully that continue to open things up. And like I said, if it weren't for that, despite all the awesome things that the Pacers did in this game, they would not have won if he wouldn't have won as many of those minutes as much as they did for sure. Okay. So listen, Dave, I know, I know, I know that Malik Monk and Nas Reed are going to finish top two and six man of the year. I, I know that. But, but should, should they? <laughs> should, should they? McConnell doesn't even get odds at a lot of places, which is just crazy to me. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. Like we just said, that's you know he just can kind of continues to be underestimated, and you know he's really embraced that uh, you know uh, Pritchard philosophy of being a, being a star in his role. Um, he seems to really take that very very seriously. I would be surprised if he even cares about the fact that he's not really mentioned in that. You know. Overall in the season, he hasn't hit double digits in points average. And I think that that's going to be tough. I feel like if you're going to do six man of the year, it's got to be like 15 ish points is sort of like the entry level for that kind of thing. And so I wonder if it's just maybe not the the volume uh, that people are looking for to be able to hand out that award. But, you know, it's uh, it, it is it is incredibly impressive what he's able to do. Um, I have been impressed that there hasn't been a weird uh, fandom push for McConnell should start <laughs> when when <laughs> Halliburton was <laughs> struggling a little bit. I was like, it's coming any day now. Uh, but uh, no, it's 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 amazing to watch and um, glad to have one of those guys. You're just glad to have on your side of the, of the team. That for sure. Yeah, the Heat hated <laughs> hated him certainly. They could not contain him. Their bench perimeter players, not particularly good defenders. They routinely got crushed by him in this game. A big part of the Pacers jumping all over the heat early in this game, their first half lead uh, got as high as I, I think it crossed 20. Yeah, 22 late in the second quarter was they were just defending their butts off in the first two quarters of this game. And yeah, and I know the heat were missing several important open threes, but they were a lot of them were contested. There were some that you were like, okay, that should have gone in. But I think the Pacers defense deserves a lot of credit for how they started this game because even though they kind of fell apart in the second half, they gave up 69 points in the second half because they started so well in the end of the floor, 46 per, first half points for Miami. They gave themselves a chance and gave themselves the wiggle room to do that. And their early game defense was particularly great. Spurs are about to blow it against the Sixers, by the way. So Pacers need to go two and one this week. That's a shame. And defense rant. Do you have anything about their first half defense? No, I mean it's it's it's, uh, it's good to see them uh, dilate it in. I mean you just you just have to be able to defend. They'll, they'll be able to win uh, playoff games, and that was an evolution that they um, embarked upon, especially with the trade for Siakam. Um, you know, uh, trying to get something that was maybe a, a little bit more defensive minded. Having Neesmith being able to play uh, consistent mis minutes um, is uh, good. And you know, on paper. You know, Halliburton obviously is not necessarily the, the best defender, but I like the lineup of Nemhard, Neesmith, Siakam, Turner. You know, like that should work as a good defensive unit. And I mean, it's taken a while for them to maybe uh, gel a little bit, but they don't need them to be uh, a top five defense in the NBA, but they just need that to be, uh, you know, a solid thing that they can rely on, not just in this season, but as they go into the future, if they're going to give Siakam a big contract, you need to see those defensive signs and, uh, they've been able to uh, make that happen, uh, which is which is good. I mean, it's they're going to need that obviously to be able to win. Uh, can that combine with you know Siakam's ability to kind of hit tough buckets, get those kind of ISO half court shots? I mean, that's a move towards the Pacers not necessarily being the best offense in the history of the NBA anymore, <laughs> but now being a team that can get tough buckets in 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 the half court. And then also get defensive stops. Obviously, that's going to pay dividends in, in playoff games and tough games. And, uh, you know, this is a great example of the kind of thing that they can win. And hopefully, you know, the, the kind of effort and, um, uh, you know, overall defensive ability and just, you know, the, the cohesion of their play, the fact that they came out so strong in the beginning, huge difference from how they played in the championship of the play in game where i mean all of those things were weaknesses for them and so uh you know the the trade for siakam hopefully was a way of solving all of those issues and you know this is a really good sign that they've done so 
Yeah, well, the, solving solving may be a big word, but they've they've made a, a big they take a big strides in those departments. For sure. Well, I, I mean, given how good their offense was at some points this season, being capable on defense would be enough, right? right? And they weren't for a while. Now they've been capable on defense for a month or two, but their offense has not been, you know, as amazing as it was early in the season, but perhaps that balance could be better for them, right? Their net rating suggests it is. They just keep losing every clutch game until tonight. And so yeah. it has, hasn't actually it, showed up. Yeah. And so like, I mean, it, it, for a while, it seemed like their clutch strategy was mostly just like how many step back threes can help it hit. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much what they were able to do. Hey, no and problem. So, you made them all. <laughs> so now, you know, and now it's not not quite as much. And you know, um, um, Halliburton uh, took some hero shots, didn't really work out. Um, Turner gets his, you know, his o- one or two open shots in, in the clutch, and he wasn't really able to uh, kind of knock those down. So they needed some uh, better answers in there. But love seeing Neesmith get the tough bucket, and we, you know, see, uh, saw Siakam uh, make some plays as well. And you know, th- they're making obviously um, some strides at getting better at getting uh, uh, buckets in those situations. Um, and yeah, that's uh, they're they're going to need a little bit more of that. I would like a little bit more of the Halliburton magic to come back, though. That would be nice. That's <laughs> a, that's a little bit of a key ingredient if they're going to, to uh, make genuine waves in the playoffs. Obviously, he's been uh, slowly coming back and playing better, but um, you know, hitting those killer shots at the end, um, a little bit more of that would would be nice. That would be welcome. I would take it. So here is what what stood out to me about them winning this game in the clutch because. Look, the Nets game, they were up three late, blew it. Everybody knows the Bulls game, up three. And I would I don't even know what to call that. They did everything right, and DeMar DeRozan just said, screw you guys, <laughs> this is, right. you lose. The Timberwolves game, same thing with Ant. They lost those games. This time, 103-101 with 321 to go. Dave, I won't say who I said it to. I won't say what I said, but I did admit I thought they were going to lose at that yeah. point. When they were up two with about three minutes to go, I thought the Heat were going to win. The Pacers' next possession – Halliburton shimmies into the lane, fakes a pass to the corner, layup. Their next possession, Aaron Neesmith hits two free throws. Their next possession, Pascal Siakam scores a driving layup after Halliburton got in the ball and won. Their next possession, Aaron Neesmith, same thing. He drives to the basket and won. For two minutes, they scored every single trip down the floor. Their first miss was with a minute to go when Halliburton missed a reverse layup where he thought he got fouled. And then they got a stop on the next possession. They were up eight at that time. So, their, their defense wasn't perfect late. Tyler Hero was going crazy. They fouled the three-point shooter. Caleb Martin hit a tough shot. In the, not that tough. He hit a shot in the lane. But they were almost perfect on offense late, and that's how they created the margin for error to actually win this one. And they did the foul-up three strategy that they tried to do against the Bulls. And, it, and that, guess what? A miracle didn't happen this time. In fact, an opposite miracle happened. The Heat had a lane violation on the second free yeah. throw. So they couldn't even miss it on purpose, which was pretty wild. But that's what they, I mean, they still didn't defend probably good enough or as well as they would want in the clutch, but they got over it because they just, their offensive execution was perfect in the final three minutes of this game. 14 points in the paint in the fourth quarter, you know, <laughs> it's wow. like, if, if, if you're going to win a tough game, you have to score in the paint. I mean, like, and you, and you say, you rattle off all those buckets. Yeah. I mean, none of those were miracle threes. None of, I mean, you love the see sensational plays, but you know, uh, Halliburton, when he got his layup, I mean, he was slicing through trying to find someone to pass to, and they just kind of let him alone, so he got in, you know, and they just – every single play that they had resulted in shots close to the rim. And, I mean, it's – basketball has gone through a lot of evolution, but, you know, if you could just keep getting shots near the bucket, in the paint, that's what you want to end up doing. And so that was really cool to see. They didn't just have to resort to um, even like a, ha- a half-decent three-point shot. If you can get in the other rim, you should do it. And so um, seeing them consistently hammer them inside um, was great. And, you know, you talk about the defense kind of late in the game. It was a little bit uh, skewed by the fact that there was that terrible call, which I was surprised that they didn't review it. Like, this is the hero three-point shot. It was definitely shot. a foul. I don't know if it was no, a shooting No, foul. it's not. That's, uh, no, if, but they didn't call it on the arm in the beginning. They called it on the, the push, the on, the, on, the, on the body. That's not a foul. It's incidental contact. And I they actually seen, fouled Hero worse on the three before that. That didn't yeah, get called. <laughs> that's true. And, and Miles Turner definitely got stripped. He got stripped. Yes, clean. he did by Bam. Yes, he did. He did. And so they did. They, so it all washes out. And I'm not saying like anything like that. But well, I mean, I've seen NBA games where they do reviews and they're like, that's incidental contact. Our bad. We're taking it off the board. I've seen that call. So it's not like one of those things where referees are like, uh, he barely touched well, them. It's, we're not going to do that. 
they should have taken that back. That's what I think. Do you um, I the, hate that they were. I hate that they didn't review that and, take, and pull it back. Do you remember the first foul that Siakam committed on a three, the Jovic three? That one I thought was wrong. That one I didn't think was a foul. I, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of off the top of my head. But I don't like being the ref guy, but that obviously was the pivotal. Sure, we'll bring it up. Sure, um, sure, sure. I just, you know, I, I, I like the league moving to a place where incidental contact is removed on replay i think that there are times when it's very obvious like in that situation he's already moving sideways he's obviously just glancing i would like to see that long term be something that they end up pulling off the board didn't end up, end up being a, a a too big a deal and of course he goes in and rips another three later in the game so you know it's it, it's a tough thing to stop but they probably shouldn't have gotten those three throws there were a lot of weird calls at the end of this game one more break here, guys. Let's talk about the great folks over at LinkedIn Jobs. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That is why LinkedIn Jobs can help you with their tools that will help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. It's not just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion with a B professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. It gives you access to professionals you can't find anywhere else. LinkedIn does all of that while making the process easy and intuitive. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact. That 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows small businesses are wearing a ton of hats. You might not have time or resources to hire, and that's why LinkedIn is constantly finding ways to make it easier. They just launched a feature, for example, that helps you write job descriptions faster and easier process. 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. You could be next. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash MBA. That is linkedin.com slash MBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. The other clutch, you mentioned this earlier, and Pat Boylan tweeted about it too. The other clutch thing that was remarkable, they made, they made their last nine free throws, right? And like in those moments, those are right. not, right. You, you can kind of use the guy's free throw percentage to say their chance of making them late in games, but not, it's a little lower, right? They're harder. <laughs> and they made all of them. They were perfect. Right. Neesmith hit two, Siakam hit, or Neesmith hit three. Siakam hit all his, Turner hit all his. I mean, they were just boop, 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 knock them down. That's huge in a game where your margin of error is so thin, being that perfect late was critical. And they kind of, I don't even know if they meant to, but with three seconds left, I was thinking like, ooh, is there enough time where they can just throw it up in the air to evaporate the clock? They avoided the foul. They did the little tiki taka passing to end the game. I love that. It was close. close. They almost got burned on it because it's a good play, but the heat, they, they didn't react. They didn't sell out to it. If they would have sold out to the, uh, to going back, they would have gotten that steal, and that would have, uh, have been a disaster. But, you know, all's well that ends well <clears throat> and ended up working out. Um, another thing that I thought was kind of notable at this is that – did you see the Iowa-UConn game um, the other night? And then you, yes. Obviously the famous moving screen and about yes. whether or not that's going to be called. That exact screen was called in this game. Bam came out and tried to pick oh, – this is like in the second quarter or something like that. <laughs> But, you know, he stepped out, pushed out a little bit. Hero tried to curl into the wing, and so they they called the foul. And so I had seen some commentary like, they would never call that in the NBA. I'm like, they they did. They did. And this, I mean, it wasn't a clutch situation. And, like, obviously that makes it a difference. But, you know, there was a – is that a foul versus not versus, like, do you call that in the clutch? If you're the kind of person that says you shouldn't call those things in the clutch, and that's what – okay. But, like, they definitely do call that foul. I've seen that called plenty of times. Uh, but uh, I would thought it was funny that it kind of happened again. Well, by the way, what a big, awesome weekend for hoops. Amazing. I right. spent the whole weekend just watching basketball games. It's been awesome. Especially in this this state. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. From, from NIT finals till now. I mean, I know Indiana State lost, but like awesome games just constantly. Yeah, um, sure. You know what's funny? Uh, to chime in on the illegal screen for like two seconds before we get back yeah. to the Pacers. The reason that call gets made so easily to me is like a lot of the illegal screens guys get away with is when they're like quasi- moving screen and quasi cutting so right. like they can feign that they're no i'm just going to the basket i'm not right. i'm not screen right but if you're popping away from the rim you're not right. you're not cutting you're just getting in the way on per, you know it, so that is so much easier to call and that does happen in the nba and that's what happened in the, the uconn game right if she went the other way it wouldn't have been an effective screen but i don't think any foul would have been called so that's yeah my, it's, a, it's another thing. one it's one of those things where the tv angle doesn't dare to do no because when i watch it in a game like um, when I watched the broadcast and I saw the angle from there, it was a little bit harder to see. But then I saw an alternate camera angle I'm like, oh, now like you can see it kind of from the re- perspective of the referee that actually called it. 
I was like, oh, that's clear as day from that perspective. You know, right. it's like, you know, so um, a little bit of that. But yeah, call call moving screens. You know, we, we can get away with it. up. And hey, um, fever. <laughs> We're a week yeah. away. We go away. Okay. Anything else that you think was particularly noteworthy about yeah. this game? I did find it fascinating. 10 for 25 for Siakam and Halliburton, only a combined 30 points. And they still won. I think that spoke to their depth of this game. Like they had a Absolutely. lot of guys step up offensively because I thought the stars would need to be important, but, and they, they were, it's not like they were bad. Halliburton sure. could have been more efficient, but you know, to, to win with that is a little surprising to me, given the stakes of this game. That's a really great sign. Um, it was also awesome seeing uh, uh, Tyrus Halliburton singing um, One Magic Moment. <laughs> one shiny okay. moment? One shiny moment, that's right, yeah. Um, that, that, that was good. Um, I, I did have the kids watching the game, and, and they ended up uh, kind of seeing that. And, uh, you know, they were kind of maybe half paying attention at that point, but they all kind of looked up like, what? what who is what is that who is singing he is not a good singer um i, I always i i love it though because like they they revealed him and then charlie said that's their best player that's an all-star i was like that's right that's right buddy you got it um another thing that i thought was funny from the game is you know they had that like that umbro ass court that they have i don't it looks like andre agassi threw up all over the court i don't know why they went with this design but <laughs> When it popped up, my wife said, "Oh my god! I'm like, where are they? is that the Pacers court?" I was like, "Why did they do that? What is that? Why? Did, what is the uh, who? What is the?" And yeah, I was like, "I agree. I have no idea why they went with uh, that specific design." Uh, they've had so many good moments with that awful font and like with the weird courts and you know there's almost like a you get an association with like fun games and fun results and like the look but like they need to change it out asap i can't have any more good memories on these courts because <laughs> people are just gonna get too attached they gotta they gotta get rid of this get it get that out of here quick and get something else in there because oh, uh, that is um you know it was ugly in the 90s and is ugly now so let's let's not do that anymore and can I rapid fire through some of my notes that I thought were important from this game? Any. I'll, if you want to stop at anything I say, please feel free to do so. Uh, one, Andrew Nemhard will not get any sort of big heralding from anyone. He was five for seven. He was being guarded by Terry Rozier, so he could kind of just get to his spots. Remember, with three steals, uh, was very efficient, was very solid on both ends, was very good on defense. My first note of the entire game was good stuff from Andrew Nemhard early. He played a solid game. Thing George number two. G George, Hill George Hill Jr. I love him. Yes, I'm a big Andrew Nemhard uh, enjoyer myself. Thing number two. Every time early in this game, and even in the second half a little bit, every time Duncan Robinson was in the game, if he switched on to Siakam, the Pacers instantly stopped what they were doing, back up, <laughs> get it over there, get it to Siakam in the post on Duncan Robinson. So Siakam was scoring a lot early, and Duncan Robinson started and only played 12 minutes because they were like, oh, okay, we can't, we can't do this. This is not, this is not working for us. So then Caleb Barton played 36 minutes off the bench because they couldn't play Duncan Robinson at all because the Pacers were just crushing it. I thought that was very funny. Yeah, it's uh, uh, 0 for 4 with uh, two turnovers. They yes. showed up, Duncan Robinson. Yeah, if he's not making threes and that's happening to him, it's just, you just can't, you can't have him out there if you're the Heat. Uh, they did the, I already talked about this, the heat going zone against McConnell when they would drop back from press Pacers were just ready. They, they, that credit to them, you know, that, that can be tricky, but they were ready to go. Um, this kind of summed up the first half to me and there's, there's some luck involved in any, every NBA game. So the heat were, like, like I said, one for 15 from their first threes and the Pacers, I think started four for seven or something it is the second quarter. The heat took a timeout. They come out of it. They drop a beautiful play. They have a baseline screen. Terry Rozier pops out. Miles Turner ends up running into uh, Andrew Nemhard and accidentally screening him a little bit. Wide open three for Rozier on a beautiful play, and Rozier missed it. And then the Pacers come down on the other end, and Miles Turner catches, and he takes a contested three with two guys contesting him, and he drilled it. And I was like, that's a six-point swing. That's just like the nature of make or miss NBA that I thought was very enjoyable. Um, and there were some more timely threes in the third that made it, including Obi Toppin, who statistically was not – incredible but played very well and it felt like every big play he made was like right when they needed it i felt like yeah and it's a it's nice to be able to have somebody that, can, that just finish plays like that if it's like a good partnership i mean I, I think they kind of envisioned him as maybe a bit more of a partner with uh tyrese halliburton 
Uh, but, you know, it's still worth the TJ McConnell if you got somebody that is uh, putting defenses in fits. Someone's got to finish the plays. And, you know, adding that three-point shot uh, to the arsenal has just made him an awesome uh, kind of glue guy. And, you know, I had kind of been a little bit dismissive about Obi Topping staying with the Pacers long term. I don't know if someone's going to try to make him a bigger part of their plans. But if he's just kind of in the mix coming off the bench, especially if their starting unit is going to be pretty good defensively, um, you know, that I like that a lot more, but yeah, he's always a joy to watch. So, so this is the, this is the lowest rate of 10 foot to, uh, foot on the line twos of Obi Toppin's career in terms of the ra- ratio of shots he takes. He's made two in consecutive games and I only remember them because I keep going, Whoa, when he takes them and he made, he made it again tonight. It was only one shot, um, which his shot diet is, I think, perfect. For his skill set. My final note was uh, that TJ McConnell played so good. We already talked about him, but we didn't say this. He closed. He was in the closing five because they were like, as the lead kept leading away, they're like, we got to put TJ back in. That's <laughs> a lot about what he was doing as well. That is the I end of my news. <laughs> it's like uh, it, Carlisle always somehow has like a tiny white point guard that goes way better than he should. You know, I don't know what, what it is about uh, uh the, his particular system that draws that out in people but they're like a match made in heaven so uh you know it's, it's always great to see and um i think that uh was it miles turner what was the quote at the uh at the end of the game about he wants to uh, be the white guy or the, like that. the white boy yeah. absolutely that's it that's uh, yeah i would i highly recommend people watch the pressers because tj was asked about that quote and he he could not figure out what to say <laughs> very funny <laughs> I'll just leave it. That's that's a very, very Miles Turner thing to say, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay, so they are not done clinching the postseason. This was obviously very important in them getting there. They're not done doing that yet. The Sixers won. The Sixers have Embiid back. There are no more back-to-backs. So I'm guessing Joel Embiid plays every game the rest of the season. So the buffer between them, that one loss they have advantage on Philly, and the tiebreaker is huge. Because they have a buffer. So here's here's what's staring at the Pacers so everybody knows. This is pretty uh, – actually, I'm going to say one thing first, Dave, if you don't mind. I'm going to go a little off the path, but it's on the path. I just went to the Mad Ants playoff game last Tuesday, and I promise this is relevant to the Pacers. The Mad Ants played the Delaware Bluecoats. They've beaten the Bluecoats this, that season. And the Bluecoats hit their first seven threes. And on their eighth three, they were fouled and made the, the free throw. Uh, and the Mad Ants were down by 15 at the end of the first quarter. They lost by like 20. So basically the first quarter was the game. I give you that example to say that is why you don't want to be in the play-in because if one team doing that, right, it it changes the trajectory of your season, your postseason, your matchups, whatever. And I know it's it's different, but it's not. It's That can happen in pro basketball. The players are good. So this game for the Pacers was critical toward avoiding the plan that is not done yet for the Pacers. So as it stands, sorry, you had something to say. Well, I was going to say, it's not like there's a, like a specific player on the Chicago Bulls or the Atlantic Hawks that could have an unbelievable game as an individual and sink the players, uh, uh, Pacers chances, right? No, yeah, they seem like two teams perfectly designed to do that. To just yeah. uh, have, you know, the Rosen or, or Trey Young go just absolutely crazy and, and, it, and how some fits. If Trey even plays again this season, but still, like, you don't, you just don't want to be in that situation, right. per- period. Uh, and also, if they're playing the Bulls or Hawks in a plan, that means that if they win that game, they play the Celtics in the first round, which is not very fun either. So here's how things stand right now relevant to the Pacers. Uh, the Cavs suck right now. They just suck. They're coming back from injuries. They're not playing good. They've lost three in a row and have won three of their last 10 games, which has put the Cavs one game ahead of the Pacers in the standings. The Cavs are 46 and 33. The Pacers are 45 and 34, which matters because the Pacers beat the Cavs twice very early in the season, their second game, and then in the in-season tournament. So the Pacers, if they beat the Cavs this coming Friday, would actually earn the tiebreaker over them. All that to say... The Pacers control their own destiny for the five seed now, which is wild, which is totally a change from like two days ago was, can they even escape the plan? They control their destiny for five. They are one win behind the Knicks and one win behind the Magic, but two losses away from those teams. Uh, The Knicks schedule is looks tricky, but is against teams with little to play for. The Magic schedule is actually tricky against meaningful opponents. So, I would say that it's possible for the Pacers to catch Cleveland and possible to catch Orlando. Probably not. 
New York or Milwaukee, but the Bucks also are not playing very well. The the that's noteworthy. The fact that they can move up is something. But not moving down is actually should be more their goal. <laughs> Six yeah. as a floor is obviously the thing. No play in. Make the playoffs. Who cares who you play? Just make it. That's the goal with this team. They traded their first round pick this year. They do not have any sort of like, well, we're in the lottery. That's a, a, a backup plan. No, they don't have that. They want to make it. So as it stands, they're one loss ahead of the Heat. They're one loss ahead of the 76ers. They hold the head-to-head tiebreaker over both of those teams, meaning they're effectively two games ahead. So they can afford one loss this week and still guarantee themselves a trip to the postseason. But that's it. If they lose more than that, they need help, whether that's a Heat loss and the Heat close Dallas, Atlanta, Toronto, Toronto. So three relatively easy games. And the Sixers schedule is like they play you and then they play me and then they play uh, the Carmel Dads Club. So uh, I presume the Sixers would go undefeated. So the Pacers not only control their own destiny, they can go two and one and guarantee themselves a postseason berth this week. Uh, react to that first and then I'll explain why I don't think it's super easy, but I will continue. Oh no, sure. I mean, it's. I mean, obviously, it's great that they have uh, some control of, of their destiny here. Um, you know, uh, there's this kind of a, a perspective of, of two things, like what the Pacers should do, and then kind of like as a fan, sort of what I'm thinking and like what I hope the the chips may may fall, so to speak. The plan is clear: win out. I mean, just win out, and the chips fall where they win. I mean, it's just insane to think that you should do anything other than that. No, I, no I, gaming it. No gaming it. No gaming it whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. but it, it does come a little bit interesting. Because of the viability of getting to the four, because it's like if you can get home possible. four, it's possible. that's great, that's yeah. great, and it's just like you take that and then you and then you worry about anything else. If you can't do that, I mean, you're, I think you're kind of in a spin cycle at three through six, you know. In that situation, if four is a little harder, if you had a choice between five and six, I'd rather be six. I mean, like I know you're talking about people what happened you know, but with, where they were versus like, but you don't want to avoid Boston, but you want to avoid Boston. Like if you have a choice of being <laughs> Look the at you. Or six, you are pilled. Oh, you, know. you are playoff pilled, baby. It's like, it's, it's wait, do I want to play the magic or the Knicks? I, whatever, you know, just whichever one, just pick whichever one you want. I, I don't really care. So, you know, <laughs> if, if you have to pick a path, that's the one, but of course the, you know, the bucks obviously, are doing whatever is going on over there, but there's still, I would, I, it, it's, it's not like that's a cakewalk anyway. You know, it's not like, it's like a huge thing. Like, Oh, you know, go to the six and then you can just steamroll over the bucks and go all the way to the Eastern conference finals. You know, it's not quite like that, but obviously because of the way that they've been playing, you feel like you have a little bit more of a fighting chance against that uh, versus the Celtics, but it's important to keep the eye on the prize. I mean, they're just trying to win their first playoff series in a very long time. I mean, and they've accomplished a lot of things through all-star bursts, maybe being, you know, all NBA of things, getting trades for all-stars, getting to the finals of the end season tournament. This is still a franchise that hasn't won a playoff series in a very long time. And it, 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 it a franchise that used to win them all the time. So, you know, it's getting that one is the goal. I mean, I'm sure internally they're like, we got to get to the Eastern Conference Finals or, you know, you don't know how high we can fly and all that sort of stuff. Like the goal is to win a playoff series because it would not be great if all of these things happened to the Pacers this season and they got knocked out in the first round, um, I don't even care if it's seven games. I mean, I think that that, wow, I'm surprised by that. Surprised at what? That reaction. That that it would be a bit of a blow uh, that if they, if they lost in the first round, I don't think they'd be psyched about it, but I think that's a totally normal and like acceptable outcome given where they started and where they are. I don't know. I, I think that, you know, it, it, I, I guess it depends on how it went. I suppose if they went seven games and it was very close, but, you know, if they ended up getting out. Yeah, if they, if they get embarrassed, it's obviously very bad. Well, I mean, not even embarrassed, but if it's if it's one like one of those 4-2 ones where, like, it, it doesn't really seem that much in doubt from the first couple of games, I think that that would be a bit of a blow. I think that, that they've had a little bit of a magic run. I think that, you know, obviously – there was a lot of insanely good vibes with, uh, uh, you know, Halliburton, especially in, in the first uh, part of the of the season. Now they've got to make a major decision about what they're going to do with Siakam. He's got to make a choice. He doesn't come back on him. There's no decision. So you keep him, no matter what it costs. No, I'm talking about him. Oh, oh, I thought you meant the Pacers. I was like, there's no Pacers decision. No, no, no. I mean, like, if they lose in the first round, they're just like, take as much money as it takes for you to come back, for sure. I mean, like. Obviously, but no, it's it's no guarantee that he comes back. Um, and it's a little bit of a crossroads in that sense. I mean, like, you know, we get 
so wrapped up in like maybe how they're doing now and what might be possible. But like, you know, they trade a couple of first round picks for a guy. If he walks, if they lose four, two, it doesn't really seem like they were ever truly in it. And then Siakam ends up going somewhere else. I mean, that's a pretty bad shake, you know, it's like, that's not completely. Yeah, if, he leaves, it's a disaster. if he leaves, it's a disaster. No doubt. Yeah. And so and I'm, I'm saying that if they are not super competitive in a first round series, I mean, I think that that would be something that, would maybe make him not it just it's good there's got to be another dance partner out there to give him you know the opportunity and the money that he wants but it's it's certainly not guaranteed by any means and you know i i feel like that possibility does increase you know if if that first round of the series doesn't work out and as the pacers say we want to take a leap we want to be not just where we are now but also be a no doubt home court advantage team and then keep climbing up with our, our young core I mean, the, the little bug in anybody's gear is going to be like, it's still Indiana. Like, they're not, they don't have a ton of resources from uh, money. They're not the coolest city. They haven't ever won a championship. And so then, like, and then, like, all this cool stuff that happened. But yeah, they just got bounced in the first round again. They're just, you know, that, that might be who they are. They need to have another season where they have to go through and then make some waves in the playoffs before people truly take them seriously as a contender. And if there's any sort of like player out there that says, and I want to get traded to a contender. I got a list of four teams. The Pacers get bounced four two in a non competitive series. Do you really think that the Pacers are going to make that list? You know, so I, mean, I think I do. Actually. I, I actually do. I mean, they still could, but I think that it's 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 it, it does actually, take a little bit of the shine off of things. You know, like all the other cool stuff that's happened this season doesn't mean anything unless they do well in the playoffs. Like that's that. interesting to me. So, so yeah. my, I don't want to. I didn't realize we get to this. This is interesting. So. Uh, I think that if they get embarrassed, obviously, like reality is a little different. But in a relatively competitive first round series, like I think they'll feel pretty good about their chances of keeping Pascal uh, in, in the summer. And my, the reason I say that, you know, I mean, it's it, like, yeah, winning's better. Duh, I'm not saying anything. It's, it'd be disappointing if they lost no matter who it's too. But their rotation right now, Tyrese Halburn, Andrew Nemhard, Aaron Neesmith, Obi Toppin, Jalen Smith, Ben Shepard all on effectively rookie scale deals, right? They are really young. Like this is su super early in their build for lack of a better term. It feels like Denver the summer they got Paul Millsap where it's like, even if they don't do awesome in the postseason, it's very easy for other players to be like, I see what's happening here, even if they don't win right away. That said, for the gamification of their upcoming week where I wanted to go after this is, the Magic play at Houston, at Milwaukee, at Philly, and then home versus Milwaukee. That's hard. That's a really big gap for the Pacers because they don't have the tiebreaker with the Magic, but that's tough. The Cavs, who the Pacers actually control their destiny versus in the standings, have Memphis, Charlotte, Indiana all at home. That's pretty easy, but the Pacers control their own destiny over the Cavs. The Knicks close. Bulls, Celtics, Nets, Bulls. Likely nothing to play for for Chicago. Uh, depending on how the Hawks do, but that's not easy either. The Bulls just beat the Knicks. So all that to say, it's possible for them to move up, but the simplest thing is just win, win games. <laughs> win games, yeah. get the seed you can, see what's happening elsewhere. There's no way to game it, but I, it's more plausible than I thought for them to continue climbing, even though I think that reality is so they should be very happy to be sixth and not in the plan. So I, I, I just... Uh generated a stat for you on the spot there's probably oh, good. i could probably go further with this but this is as close as i could get while you were, while you were talking uh, but uh <laughs> okay cleveland orlando you know the knicks and the pacers over the last four years between those four franchises there's been one playoff series win and it's because the knicks um and the Cavs played each other and the knicks won but wait, that's wait, wait, it wait. the knicks beat the mix made the knicks beat the uh, the um the Sixers that one year, right? Or who they, they had a good uh they they won a series. No, I'm wrong. That's the year the Hawks beat them. I'm wrong. Yep. I'm wrong. You're right. And then it's probably further than that. Uh, I think it's it's I think it's further than that because that's all I had time for, you know. But they played each other yeah. and that's what got the win, right? It's a yeah. bit of an Eastern Conference, uh, you know, next generation gold rush right now. You know, a yeah. lot obviously Cavs are very young. Magic are very young. Maybe Nick's not quite as young, but you know they still have a, a plenty of uh, you know uh, uh, runway left on, on their run. Some team's going to take over as like the third team in the Eastern Conference, you know. Um, and you say, well, maybe if the 76ers are fully healthy, obviously that that comes into it. Well, now they're battling for fourth. It's like 
someone's going to take those reins, right? And this po a postseason, people can make a very good argument, is going to be a thing that really separates the haves from the haves not. So that like if one team is going to really have the juice to take it to that next level, they're going to be the ones. And like Cleveland's obviously got a lot of good young talent, and so does uh, uh, you know the Magic. And so if the Pacers are going to make a serious case that they are going to be ones to go beyond that, it, this isn't everything, but this is the first blow, you know, and that matters, you know, like who's going to really get it done, you know, and if they can't say that they're better than, you know, the Magic or the Knicks or, or even the Cavs in the state that they're in, you know, like only one team can be, you know, that that next step in that yeah. a probable home court. So someone's going to take those reins. That would be my pitch. It's just the Pacers are young and, you know, they've got a lot of things that they can evolve in the future, but the, the, it just happens when it happens, you know, someone's got to step up, make the um, um, hierarchy of the Eastern Conference shake out a little bit. And those teams aren't getting any worse in the next couple of years. So I think this is going to matter. This is going to matter to people and how the, the long term standings go. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. But uh, they're all in the up and up. And, you know, the proof is in the pudding. How many cliches can I get into one <laughs> sentence? But, you know. <laughs> But that's, but it, you know, that's how I back into the beginning of this game. That's what was just so cool to see about this game. It was a huge game, and they came out and kicked ass. Didn't turn the ball over. Hit all of their three throws. They were awesome from the beginning. They probably the end game of this could have gone a little bit better. But they drilled, of uh, uh, you know, baskets in the paint. They kept attacking over and over again, and they ended up getting it done. And I think that that bodes well for the the Pacers' postseason hopes. And somebody's gonna, you know, have a bragging rights going into uh, the future of the Eastern Conference. And I hope it's the Pacers. Would Pacers Magic even be on NBA TV? How would that end up for, <laughs> for the league scheduling purposes? Pacers Cavs also might be in that boat. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's 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 so funny how many times. I mean, Paul George obviously could do cool dunks and everything like that, but like this team's exciting. Like this, people yeah, like the Pacers. Yeah. It's 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 a little bit different than in the past where it's just like, oh, this is going to be like a defensive slog of this tiny small market team. <laughs> the Pacers Raptors series when the Pacers weren't that good at the end of the PG era was like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, but they they got they got a little sizzle to them. I think that, uh, but I it, that's still not going to stop uh, Pacers Magic from definitely being the one that <laughs> if people are going to ignore, they're, it's the one they're going to ignore. So. Uh, yeah, that would that would. Be... A lot of Not going to be a radio. A lot of noon tip-offs coming, uh, coming our way if that's the series in the first round. I, uh, I see. Uh, yes, for sure. I mean, you know, it's they're they're, they're sort of the, the small market defensive slogger. So it's not our fault this time. <laughs> that's right. Well, the fact that we can have these discussions is only possible because they won this game, right? Absolutely. Had they lost, it would be all about well, can the Sixers lose? Can the Heat lose? Can the Pacers still get to sixth? Instead, they control their destiny. The last thing I want to squeeze in, they play the Raptors on Tuesday. And I find that game to be extremely fascinating, Dave. You know why? I don't. Because the Raptors suck. And so in my head, and in a lot of people said, it's been, that's an easy one. They can win that one on their quest to win through this week. I agree the Pacers are better than the Raptors. You know what else matters? The Raptors have the Pacers' first-round pick and would very much like it if they could push the Pacers toward the lottery. I think that might be the last game of the season the Raptors try and try pretty hard. I actually think the Hawks game will be the easiest Pacers game because the Hawks have nothing to play for. They'll be 10th already because they don't have the tiebreaker with the Bulls, and the Raptors game could be harder because of that first-round pick ramification. That's it. That is it. That also only matters because the Pacers won. Had they lost, it would just be they've got to win every game. That, and you know, never estimate kind of personal pride when you have uh, teams that made a major trade. I mean, the, yeah. people always kind of uh, show up for those games. So, um, you know, it's uh, uh, that, that'll that be an interesting one. And like it's <laughs> being able to beat them to improve their own draft stock is a funny angle. Uh, although I don't know if this draft, it, it matters all that much. But they, they all say it's a bad draft, Tony. I don't know anything about that, but. <laughs> you know, what? It, it, I, I felt attacked. I saw a tweet that was like, when your team trades a top 10 pick in the 2024 draft, Oh, it's a bad draft. It's fine. When your team acquires an early second rounder. Awesome. All right. <laughs> it's like I did. I did, in fact, grade the Pacers trades on that scale, which was not smart <laughs> for me to do. Whoops. Whoops. My bad. Whoopsies. 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 Uh, Whoopsies. Fun game. Everybody stepped up when it mattered. Big plays all around. And it's off day tomorrow. Everybody, first of all, listen, I went to IU. I want Purdue to win. <laughs> I just like... It'd be cool for a lot of people I know. It'd be cool for the state. Go Boilers. 
Uh, I, I, I also went to IU and I'll also be cheering, cheering for Purdue for sure. Yeah. And, you know, it's, um, and in a way, like I'm not a big basketball, a uh, college basketball guy by any means. I did watch a single minute of men's college basketball before, uh, you know, the tournament, but, um, uh, even with that, I mean, Purdue clearly kind of, they've earned sort of the spot of being yeah. the top dog in Indiana. I yes. think, I mean, like just as a, any angle that you take, they've clearly been the look at the superior college team. So I think that I am kind of rooting for them to like cement that crown. I don't think people would be too like, ha ha. If they uh, ended up losing to a, an excellent UConn Dominant. squad. Yep. But I, you know, I, I like to see them just sort of like finish that off. They've suffered enough. I think, you know, it's, it's time to, <laughs> to get the crowd. And I, I love seeing just kind of an old school, big man, not su super, bullish on his uh, NBA prospects, but, you know, being able to kind of uh, walk off into the sunset of a, of a college career with an, uh, a title would be great, especially since he can't get NIL money. I didn't know that. That sucks. He's Canadian. He's not allowed to take the money because of, I think he has a student visa and so that would violate his visa or something like that. Like he, he's not able to get the, the same kind of money that other players are able to get. And that's yeah, there's no, there's no way around those laws. So. That sucks. Uh, well, uh, you know, um, you know. Hopefully, he 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 puts the check that he gets from being like the fifty seventh pick or whatever. Oh and, no, like, he's, going to, he's going to the first round. He's going to the first round. You think he's good in the first round? I I don't want to speak too much on what I think of his future in the NBA, but I think he's going to go in the first round. Yeah. Yeah. So you're bullish on you're bullish no, on him. No, no, I don't. I, I okay. I didn't. I don't want to do this discussion. I would not pick him okay. in the first round. Okay. I think he's going to go in the first round. How about that? Um. No. So that's cool. Uh, go Boilers. If you're a Purdue fan, thanks for listening this far, and thanks for listening at all. Good luck today. Hope you're not too stressed. Thing two, I, are you psyched to be in the path of totality? Um, I can't I'm, wait. I'm, I'm psyched that people are psyched. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I think, <laughs> I think it's going to – Well, yeah. It's like, you, it, it, you idiot on the back of that? <laughs> well, I, no, no, no. I'm saying like it, I would do anything that people are excited about. Like Fair. if you say we're all doing blah blah blah, blah as long as it's not in like immoral or, or too dangerous, I'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm in. Yeah. So um seeing everybody get all hyped up for it, it's something to experience, you know. Uh, I've seen I've been part of maybe kind of eclipse is in the past, you know, but um I think that obviously being like really directly on the line of totality is great. We're going over to, you know, a uh, family member's house and we're having to cook out and all that sort of stuff. And it's Sweet. kind of like an unofficial day off. My my daughter is going into her. Uh, not, she goes back to school on Tuesday, but it's been like two weeks off plus that day, all <laughs> off in a row. Which is awesome. parents love that. We're very excited when kids have that many days off in a row. It's, I it's a treat. I would never travel for something like this, but I'm psyched that it's where I live. I really I think yeah. it'd be cool to see. I think it's awesome also as a loser that the Suns and Heat both lost Sunday night. Heck yes. <laughs> the totality hit the NBA. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> it took me a second. It took me a second. Wow. Uh, that was a fun part of the game. Pacers beat the Heat before the sun, or the moon could do it. All right. That's clearly a lot of stuff to say if that's where we're ending. Dave, thank you for the time. Dave wanted to talk about this game, which I always appreciate. And, of course, I like having <laughs> him on the show. <laughs> I, I will explain later. Um, anyway. Dave, thank you. Where can people find you? Your tweets, your thoughts on the Indiana Pacers and other things. Another time pod on on Twitter. I'll never call it whatever it's supposed to be. It's Twitter, man. It's still Twitter. It'll always be Twitter. It is Twitter. Twitter. I still say Twitter, and I think it's silly that we have to, in AP style, put formerly known as. Everybody knows what it is now. We don't have to do that anymore. It's, it's dumb. Um, tomorrow... We will look a little deeper into all these scenarios and tiebreakers because there's no NBA games at all. Uh, look a little at the Raptors, all sorts of fun stuff about the Pacers. And then uh, guests probably Thursday, Friday this week, but I'm just going to do a show every day until the Pacers are out, including weekends. So uh, guest dates will be a little different because it's a seven-day-a-week show now. Dave, thank you for the time. Everybody, thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed a longer show after a big win. We'll see you soon.